Hi, friends. I'm so excited to share this interview with you with Rohit Koval. I know that those of you who listen in real time, I wanted to just give you something for when you're putting everything back. Right? So I've been thinking for months about like what would be the best conversation for when you're just putting everything, you're turning your kitchen back over or you're returning from the trip and unpacking all the things or whatever it is, is you're kind of moving yourself back into real life and into this really special time of Sphera, which sometimes you know, it can take us a minute even to notice it's happening because we're so busy recovering from Pesach, which hopefully was wonderful for you. So enjoy this episode with whatever it is that you're getting done in the meantime. And um, and I would love to hear your thoughts. All right, Viva. All right, Rashi Koval. Now that I know how to say your name, welcome to the podcast. <laughs> it's a little education. <sighs> yes, no, because I have to say that now because everyone else is going to be like, if they've all been thinking your name wrong, like I have, they're all going to think I'm saying it wrong. So <laughs> I want them to know we're going to, this is what we're going to create this episode. We're going to let everyone know how to say your name. So awesome. Rochi, I'm sure really the vast majority of the listeners here know who you are, have heard about your work. Thank you so much for taking the time to come here and, and, and speak to this audience. So excited. I've been following you for a while and uh, I think you do great stuff too. So I'm really Thank excited you. to partner. here. Thank you. So let's just do a little introduction. So sure. how to glow community meet Rochi. Rochi, you could introduce yourself. Yes, absolutely. So hi, everybody. I am 48 years old. I live in Cleveland, Ohio. I am a mother to seven kids ranging in age from 28 to 12. This October, we will be married for 30 years. Thank God. And uh, we have two kids in law. Thank God. Wow. My husband and I started a cure of organization 20 years ago, which is now a full fledged shul and um, here in Cleveland. And we just do a lot of teaching. I got very interested in teaching Musser 15 years ago, which is a Jewish approach to self transformation as a primary path to spirituality, which I wrote a book on called soul construction, which we'll be referencing here. <laughs> I teach a lot of muster classes and I am also a trip leader for momentum, which is like a birthright for Jewish moms. Um, so I'm an educator for momentum too. And um, I'm super passionate about Torah, about using Torah wisdom to live your best life, to become the best you and, and to really improve and enhance relationships. And you know, the women that I teach are always telling me, they're like, everyone needs to learn Moser, every business person, every politician, every, everything, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm really passionate about that, that, that studying Moser about like, just taking a good, hard look at our character traits can transform everything about our lives for the better. Mm -hmm. I, this has been coming up very frequently in my coaching recently. I mean, it comes up a lot, but like every once in a while, I'll be in a situation where it's like four people all at once it's the same thing, you know, and <laughs> it's been this idea of like, just noticing the difference in how we feel when we're, when we forget that we're here to grow huh. and we're just like reacting to our life. And then yeah. when we like have that moment of realizing like, oh, wait a second, this is here for me, this yep. challenge, this person, this situation yep. is here for me. And then yep. we plug back into that journey of growth. And all of a sudden we actually want that in our life. Yeah. <laughs> that thing that we've and been trying I, to get rid of. And I think it's interesting that you use the word forget mm -hmm. because a lot of times, like, you know, <clears throat> I'll be teaching something and somebody will say, wow, that's such a good reminder. It wasn't necessarily that they didn't know it, but we forget it when we're mm -hmm. in the heat of a moment and we're feeling um, really stuck and really scared and really frustrated. And then like, all the wisdom and all the truths kind of like float away somewhere. And then we need to like bring them back, mm -hmm. you know, and this is why it's so helpful, you know, whether it's regular muster study or regular therapy or listening to podcasts like yours on a regular basis, it just helps us remember the truths that are already somewhere in our heads. Of course, we'll learn new things along the way too, but a lot of it, and I'm speaking for myself as a teacher of muster, I also have to remember when I'm in the heat of a moment. So the reason we wanted to do this conversation, you know, with this timing is that we're, you know, Pesach just ended for, for people who are listening to this podcast episode, you know, it, at, on time, which some people are still catching up. They're like, I'm on 53 and I'm going to catch up. But um, for those who are listening to it as it's coming out, Pesach just ended, we're going into Sphira. And um, I feel like there's such an incredible potential of this time for us in the year. 
And at the same time, sometimes we're just kind of like recovering. <laughs> we're like in such recovery mode that it it's like off to the right. Like sphere has like already been going for a little while before I'll like clue in and be like, oh, right, this thing is happening. There's this kind of opportunity for me right now. Um, so I was hoping that we could like use this as an opportunity to get a little bit more intentional about and and realistic. Can we also get realistic? <laughs> For sure. Yeah. Realistically I'm, I'm all about, intentional. I'm all about being real <laughs> yes. and authentic and just making it super practical. Yeah. So tell us a little bit like what what's Sphere all about? Or what what is it that you like to teach about about Sphere yeah. Summer? Yeah. So the thing with Sphere, you know, it's sort of like Simcha's Torah. Like no one ever really knows anything about Simcha's Torah because you've been so busy with Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot. Like, mm. you know, by the time Simcha's Torah comes around, my kids are like, wait, what is this? <laughs> what are we doing? You know, like, there's no time to teach about that. Yeah. So I feel like Sphira, by the time Sphira starts, you've been so consumed with getting ready for Pesach that you, you don't even have a minute to think about Sphira until like you're saying you're like a week or two in, right? And then you've lost a part of it. So the the whole thing that Sphira is about, it's about, it's about getting our our neshamos ready to get the Torah. And so it's a seven week process. That's how long it took the Jews in the desert. And that's how long it takes us. You know, it's like Pesach was like the engagement of the Jews to, to B'nai, of, of the Jews to Hashem and Shavuos is the wedding. Now I know a seven week engagement is very short, <laughs> but that's, that's the time that they needed to get ready. So, so the Torah gives us this seven week program, this seven week curriculum of how to bring ourselves up to the level that we're ready to receive the Torah. You know, it's actually very interesting that it's all about character traits, right? It's not like week one, work on kosher, week two, work on, on your, you know, mm -hmm. observance of Shabbos and week three, work on, you know, being honest in your business. It's, it's all about your character. And this is why Rabbi Stroll Salanter felt that working on one's character could be a primary path to spirituality. Um, and I have found this for many, many, many of my students over the years. Um, and my book, after each chapter, there's a testimonial from one of my students who are describing how working on their character has made them feel closer to God and closer to other people. So, you know, we have the first week is kindness and the second week is boundaries and the third week is balance. And, and the fourth week is looking at the big picture and the fifth week is looking at the short term goals. And the sixth week is about you know, eternity and whatever, I'm not saying them all, you know, the seventh week is about the majesty of the human being. But for me, what's so fascinating about these seven character traits, the spheros, as they're called, is this concept of balance. We have kindness on the one hand and boundaries on the other hand. That's week one and week two. Week three is called, is called Tiferes, which means harmony. It's about the balance of those two character traits. And then, and then we have another round of three, you know, in the next three weeks, but I'll just focus on these three for a minute. And I think particularly in marriage, which is, I know your primary mm -hmm. focus. Yeah. This is actually fascinating because so often what happens is that step one, we're attracted to another person in the ways that they are different from us. I'll give you an example. I am a very regimented person. I'm very punctual. I'm very type A. I have my lists. I, I have my schedule. I do things on time. My husband is much more fluid. He's much more spontaneous. And when we first met, I found that so refreshing precisely because it was different from me. Mm -hmm. So that step one is we often, you know, opposites attract. We often get attracted, right? If someone's very quiet and shy, they might be attracted to someone who's super loud and extroverted. They're like, wow, that's so cool. I'm so not like that. Step two, and this could happen after you're married for six months, a year, two years, I don't know, however long, it starts to get on your nerves. Like, why are you so fluid about time? We need to get places on time. There are appointments and there are expectations. And now right? there's kids who have bedtimes. Right. Exactly. So it was cute when it was just you and me, but now it is a toddler. Right. Exactly. Ruffle Goldbaum, who is also a marriage educator, talks about this all the time. The very thing that attracted us is the thing that annoys us. Yes. And also step three, if a person is working on themselves and can evolve to this point, is that it is the blending of the opposites that creates a sum that's greater than its parts. So I have what I have achieved balance when I have integrated what about my spouse is different from me and can help me to become a more balanced person. So the ideal would be that through my spouse, I can learn to be a more relaxed. 
I can learn to sometimes ditch my schedule and be spontaneous, right? And that my spouse can also learn from me how to be regimented when that's what the moment calls for. So when you think about these, the first three weeks, which is kindness, boundaries, balance, usually when you look at a couple or even, you know, two friends in a friendship or two siblings or two people who work together or whatever that relationship might look like, very often one of them is more of the kindness model more giving, more chill, more trusting. And the other one is more boundaried. You can even call that extrovert and introvert. It's one way to look at it, right? More guarded, more, you might call it suspicious, more deliberate in who is receiving these parts of me. Mm -hmm. And then it's important to recognize, like sometimes we get so stuck in, well, you're right and I'm wrong. This is the right way to do it. This is the wrong way to do it. This is the part that I like. This is the part that I don't like. But actually what these character traits are telling us is there's a time to work on being kind. There's a time to work on having boundaries, but actually the third week, Tiff Ares, the balance, that's really the ultimate goal. Each one of these character traits corresponds to one of our avos. So Avraham was kindness. Yitzchak was boundaries. Yaakov was balance. Yaakov was the one who was called Bechir Ha'avos, the chosen of all the fathers. Why? Because he pulled the best from Abraham and the best from Yitzchak, and he integrated it to a balanced thing. He knew when to give when he had to give. He knew when to contract when he had to contract. Mm -hmm. So I think it's so important in relationships that when we start chafing against what about our the other person is different, we can say, this person was put into my life to help me be more balanced. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that takes humbleness and self-awareness, which are prerequisites to growth. And a certain and a certain stability of ego. I think also to have that, to be able to even get right. to that humble place. Well, I, but yeah, I, we, right. we talk about this idea of um, make him your guru. That's how we talk about it, right? Like he's, you're given your guru. So you need to learn how to chill out. You're going to get the chill husband or you need to learn how to, you know, have stronger priorities. He's yeah. going to push you there. Like it's in some way we have that person to learn from in our, in yeah. our spouse. And, and I think also, Part of the reason why people feel discomfort in a marriage is because they feel like it reveals their weaknesses, but there's nothing to be ashamed of in discovering one's weaknesses. That just shows you where your work is. Isn't it good to know where your work is? You know, it's like, yes. it's like, you see that plumber, again for the neurons in the back, <laughs> <need> to hear <laughs> it. you know, it's like if a plumber tells you, you know, your pipes are rusted and they're really old. And if you don't replace them, something is going to happen. So a part of you is covering your ears and saying, la, 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 I'm not listening. Mm. But really, I would rather know that I have rusted pipes and that I need to do something about it. Okay, but to play devil's advocate, I think we need to flesh this out. I think this could be like the most important conversation we have here. I am not my pipes. Yeah, right. My pipes can be flawed and my pipes can be rusted and they can need to be replaced. And like, they might be mine. But there's my identities. Of course. Not it's not your whole that. identity. It's not your whole identity. It's not your whole identity. It's not even part of your identity because it can be changed. It's just the starting mm. point of your work. Mm, that's your identity it. That's beautiful. Is gonna be, yes, your yeah. identity is going to be far more forged or revealed, rather, by how you handle that information than what that information is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I was, I was born and I see this like from my kids, like some of them are just born like me, you know, my husband and I always joke, there's two kinds of people in the world, the filers and the pilers, you know, <laughs> usually the filer marries the piler. No, we're <laughs> just both pilers in my house. <laughs> okay. So then you have to hire a filer. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, exactly. But I can see from like, when my kids come out of the womb, if they're a filer or a pilot, <laughs> you know, yes. it's so fascinating. So there's no shame in what am I in my nature? That's how Hashem made me, you know, mm-hmm. there's no, there's no shame in that. Neither is it who you really are. Like I have blue eyes. I get compliments about my blue eyes. Did I do anything to have blue eyes? No, everybody knows that. I didn't make these eyes blue. I say thank you because it's a nice thing to say when people give me a compliment, right? But when people give me a compliment on something I worked for, that feels really good. That's who I really am. 
right? Mm -hmm. So there's no shame in knowing I happen to have a bit of a rigid personality. I happen to be a bit of a judgmental person in my default mode when I'm not working on myself, right? No shame there. That's how Hashem made me. I was born that way. But then the question becomes, what do I do about that? Right? That's the starting point of my work. And then if I'm willing to be humble and open and work on it and regret where I've gone wrong and examine it and do better, that means my identity is a growing person. That's really who I am. Mm-hmm. Right. And who we are essentially is like underneath is what you're saying, right? It's underneath yes. all these character traits. It's underneath all of these like external things that people can see yes. and judge and experience. And, yes. and, and the work is where that piece of us gets to interact yes, and come out into because the world. as you said we're here to grow that's the part we forget so my flaws were given to me to see what i'm going to do with them right. and my strengths were given to me to see what i'm going to do with them right yeah. let's take it on the other side let's say i happen to be a good writer i love to write okay i've been complimented for my writing people say i'm a good writer thank god i'm very grateful for that is that my identity no why I could do lots of things with that. I could ignore it. I could write mean letters to the editor. I could write scathing blog posts that are full of lush and hara. It's just a tool. Mm. Do with it what you choose. It's your choices that matter. Your talents are not what you did. Mm. Yeah, this really turns. I mean, I th- I feel like because, you know, this is cliche at this point, but our our world has become so completely external. And so we're all to the point of, of being able to sit with you when you're like, oh yeah, blue eyes. I didn't do anything to deserve that. And like, really I'm more than my eyes. Like, I feel like most, most people listening to this podcast, it's okay. We're on that level. Right. But we, but, but we it's, also it's even more it. than that. It's like another layer pull, pull back. It's not just your eyes. It's also your meatos. It's also That's your, right. your, your natural tendencies. It's also your, yes, totally. I have, I have my similar one um, for your writing is like, I can be very, very good with language. Like I can come up with the phrase that will bring something home. And one of the things I struggled with so much is I would always have the best insult on the tip of my tongue. (laughs) When I was a teenager, I could be the one who could like drive it home. Right. And like, just because I'm capable of coming up with the language doesn't mean that I get to use it. That's right. But I like what you're, you know, like just thinking of it that way, like we're all given that one place where we're, we have that strength. And where we come out is how we use it. So, right. So two things about that. First of all, the mistake that we make as a culture is when we identify people, not by their choices, but by the stuff that they had nothing to do with. Like, you're so beautiful. You're so talented. Mm -hmm. And we become obsessed with beauty, talent, IQ, when it is far more revealing to see what does a person do with their beauty, talent, and IQ. That's the first point that I want to make. And I really try to do this in my parenting because, you know, Pirkei Ovo says, Lefum tara agra, according to the effort is the reward, right? What does Hashem mm-hmm. want to see from us? How hard are you trying? Hashem doesn't care about the stuff he gave us for free. That's not relevant. Those are just the pieces in the, in the board game. So I really try to praise effort and you know, gripped, like when I'm talking to my kids, instead of praising achievement or talent, because achievement and talent is not what, right? I, I'm I'm far more interested in praising somebody who used what Hashem gave them for, for the good. Um, you know, and the second thing that I want to be, say about the spheros, um, which you sort of touched on before, is that every character trait Every, everything that you have is inherently neutral. Every character trait that you're born with is inherently neutral. So chesed, for example, the first of the spheros, which is kindness, right? Kindness can become radicalized, right? Like we're not supposed to give more than 20% of our money to tzedakah. Why not? If it's a mitzvah to give a little tzedakah, isn't it more of a mitzvah to give a lot of tzedakah? The answer is no. There's such a thing as too much kindness, right? Think about this in terms of ideology. You're right, you're right, and you're right, and everybody's right. That's too much kindness, right? So the next week we come along with boundaries. And then, right, that says, no, chesed can be taken to an unhealthy extreme. Every midah can be taken to an unhealthy extreme. So how am I using the character traits that Hashem gave me 
also means being a person of balance, right? Boundaries can also be taken too far. We, we are now, the pendulum has swung very far towards self-care. I don't have to make my neighbor meals when they have a baby because self-care. I don't have to have guests for Shabbos because self-care. I don't have to go to Shul Shabbos morning because self-care, right? It, Keep it on aim. Is good. What? Keep it on aim. Yeah. Yeah. Now self-care is good, but self-care can get radicalized. Mm -hmm. Everything, right? Self-care is basically boundaries. That's what it is. I'm putting a boundary to protect me, good or bad. Good. Can I get radicalized? Yes. It can become a modality of cruelty towards doing good for other, other people because I'm now always pulling my, putting myself first. Mm -hmm. So that's a big part of it too. Like if I have a Mida, let's say, you know, like you were saying, you have the, the gift of gab, which is beautiful. Guess what? It, not only it can be used for the good or for the bad, but it can also be taken to an unhealthy extreme, right? I'm also like that. I always have something to say. And I, I like the way it comes out of my mouth. Sometimes my work is to not say it because I need to make space for other people. Yeah. So even that positive attribute can become unhealthy. So that's part of what the spheres are showing us. There's this side and there's this side. Here's the balance. There's this side. There's this side. Here's the balance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I love it. I feel like just like, that's exactly what I wanted. Right? I wanted us to just get to like a really, really practical, what does this mean for me? And just remembering that like, if we give ourselves that entire week to explore chesed, where, where, where am I holding with chesed right now? Where am I holding with, with kindness or giving? And where might there be some room for me to grow, knowing that next week I'm going to go into it's Gavura, right? It's the second week. So yeah. go into boundaries or Gavura, however we want, wanted to find that. I'll, I will be going there, which almost gives me more freedom to explore the Chesed piece yes. more, right? That right. week, because next week I'll be able to go here. And then, mm -hmm. as you said, then we're in a space where we can integrate. And I think that's right. amazing. You know what it kind of reminds me of? I don't know. I don't know if they had this in Israel or if you were in Israel at this time, but for a while there was this fitness craze here. It was a chain of um, gyms called Curves. Yeah. Okay. So it was this 30 minute cycle and you would spend two minutes on each machine and then they would say, change stations now. And then, you know, I have no idea if there was any science behind this or whatever, but they all closed. So maybe there was a reason for that. Um, but it was like the gym was putting you through this program. And taking the decision making off your head, like, you know, when people go to the gym, they're like, well, what should I do? Should I go on the elliptical? Should I go on the, you know, treadmill? Should I go on the bike? You know, and then people hire personal trainers to help them because they don't know what to do, what to focus on. So it's like curves put you, well, what a lot of people liked about it is that you, eventually you got your whole body done because you were going on each of these machines. I feel like <laughs> Sphera is sort of putting you through this seven week program, a week on this, a week on that, a week mm -hmm. on that, you know, so you don't have to. Um, stress about what's happening next because it's it's in the program. It's already, mm -hmm. you know, set up for you. And the cool part about it is that let's say the week that you're spending on chesed. So every day of that week, chesed gets partnered with itself and each of the other traits so that each day of the sphere, you get this unique combination. So there's chesed combined with chesed, ultimate kindness. On that day, you say yes to every single person who asks you anything. The next day, it's chesed with boundaries. You're more discerning. To you, yes, not so much. Not right now. Yes to you, right? The third day, it's going to be chesed with balance. Sometimes yes, yes. Sometimes yes, no, right? The fourth day, it's going to be long-term chesed, net, um, netzach, eternity. Long, a chesed that's going to have long-term ramifications. The next one is short-term chesed. Chesed that's only relevant today. Tomorrow, nobody's going to remember that I ever did it right? Mm. The third one is going to be yesod, chesed should be yesod, foundation. That's that's like about um, about sexual boundaries and keeping that part, that energy, you know, in its right boundaries. So doing chesed with that, whatever that means in each particular person's life. And finally, the last day will be chesed um, which means chesed in a way that enhances my majesty as a daughter of Hashem. What kind of chesed could I do? You know, there's actually a beautiful book by Rabbi Yaakov Haber. It's called Sephiros. I was just going to say this. Are you kidding? Yeah. yeah. No, 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 not at all. On my shelf and right over there. He makes yeah. it super duper practical. A lot of what I learned about Sephira comes from that book. And he he gives like a little assignment every day yes. for how to make this combination real. So it's not just that every week you're working on this media, but you're learning how to apply it in each of its iterations. Mm hmm. Oh, okay. Wait, we still have a little bit of time because there's so many things going through my head that I want to talk to you about. So, <laughs> so 
from here, I want to talk about, and then I have to circle back to, to discussing with you something that you said on when you were on the DMC podcast recently. Sure. So brilliant. Um, but I want to start with, it's, it, and, it's, and I want to, if you could give us a little bit more about your book um, in this conversation, but I'd love to hear, explain how, because I think everyone listening to this podcast is into self-development. Mm-hmm. What you're bringing in more explicitly than what we talk about, I think normally is self-development as a path to spirituality. Mm-hmm. Spell it out for me. Could you okay. like, what? Absolutely. So the thing about Musser, which is self-development as a path to spirituality is this, the main point of it is transformation to make yourself a better person. However, it's not possible to work on yourself and not have it spill over onto all your relationships. So it's really about yourself, but it will by definition impact everyone else. I'll give you an example of something I heard a long time ago. What is the difference between mitos and manners? Mm-hmm. Right? Manners, you're polite, you're nice, you give other people compliments, you say please and thank you. Isn't that the same thing as having good mitos? The answer is no. Manners are skin deep and are relevant only when other people are around, Hmm. right? If somebody else is around, I'm not going to pick up a piece of chicken and eat it with my bare fingers. That's not polite. But if I'm standing alone in my kitchen at 2 a.m., why not? I'm not making anyone else uncomfortable. It's just me. Musser says, you are a child of God. Don't stand up in the kitchen at 2 a.m. and eat chicken with your bare fingers. You are a dignified, beautiful human being. Take a plate, sit down, wash your hands, take a fork and knife, feed yourself like a child of God. It's about refinement, personal refinement, personal evolvement. Even when it affects no one, it you are transforming as a human being. By definition, you know, like, like the wine at Havdalah, there will be this spillover effect. It's not just about your relationships, but it can't help but enhance all your relationships. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And this, and and primary relationship being our relationship with Hashem, meaning yes, as all, we're all. developing, and the idea of like we we're talking about the sun Shabbos, right? That the idea of like what what is closeness with Hashem? Because Hashem's not like I can't I can't say like I can't go get a plane ticket and go visit, but similarity, right? Similarity in Midos is spiritual closeness, and so then that mm-hmm. can develop that yeah. relationship as well. And, and one of the interesting things about Musser, and that's why when I wrote my book, I didn't actually publish it through a Jewish company. I published it through mm. a, a company that actually markets to religious Christians because I felt that there was such mass appeal. A big part of the reason why I teach Musser is because, you know, I teach non-religious Jews primarily. And I found that it was such a gateway to Torah because everybody wants to know. Well, okay. I shouldn't say everybody. A lot of people want to know how to be a better person. Right. And and this is about how to be a better person. Everybody wants to know how to improve. Most people want to know how to improve their relationships. This is a way to improve their relationships, right? You don't even really have to start out with God in the picture. You know, the Torah has incredible wisdom on kindness, on how to, I mean, these are the chapters in my book, acceptance, generosity, forgiveness, silence, renewal, happiness, speech, favorable judgment. These are universal character traits that a growing person wants. Then what happens? You start studying this wisdom, right? And then you say to yourself, this is brilliant. Where does this come from? And then the answer is, this comes from our tradition. This comes from our wisdom. So it ends up being a tremendous Kiddush Hashem. You know what I mean? So it it might start out as saying, how do I make my marriage better? How do I make my friendship better? How do I make my relationship with my parents better? And then it can go into, I want to be a better person for my own sake. And then it comes to, well, God is in this picture. Hashem gave us this wisdom. Oh my gosh, we're so lucky to be Jewish, right? And then what happens is we start behaving when no one's watching. Why? Because Hashem is watching. Because I'm watching. Because my neshama is watching, you know? So it ends up having this cumulative impact. Beautiful. Amazing. That's exactly what I was was hoping you could could clarify for us. So, okay, this is a little bit off topic, but I've got you here. Okay. So I have to thank you for something. So you were on the the DMC podcast, which I make no secret of being a huge, huge fan of, um, talking about parenting recently. Yeah. And um, 
what you said so explicitly is something that I feel like I've said only implicitly. Okay. And I'm so grateful because I, I want to be more explicit with this and in talking about this in the context of marriage, which was, and, you know, rephrase it for me if I, if I don't quite get it, but that we don't learn parenting techniques to get the result Mm -hmm. of a certain type of child. Mm -hmm. We learn parenting techniques to be a good parent. Yes. To do our job. Yes. And I often will say things like your husband's not a puppy. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like we're not learning. I, I love, I'm fascinated with the difference between the way male and female brains work, the way male and female motivations are. They're so, they can be so dramatically different. And of course, different personalities and different ways of being brought up, but we're not learning, to, we're not trying to understand our husband. So that at the end of the day, he's a marionette and I can pull the strings that I want and get the husband of my dreams. Right. That's manipulation. That's manipulation. Exactly. And um, so I just really, appreciated that. I appreciated that a lot. I would love to know, do you have any other thoughts about that? Yes. And I I think that this message is so insidious in our culture. You know, even when people say something like, oh my gosh, they've been married for 50 years. What's their secret? You know, you can have a couple who got divorced where one member of the couple was doing all the same things and it just didn't take in that relationship for a hundred different reasons we want to correlate results with effort we want to so badly we want that to make sense we want it to be true academically we want it to be true economically we want it to be true spiritually we want it to be true in our families our health yeah but that's just not true You can have two people who eat exactly the same and one of them is going to have cholesterol issues and one is not. You can have two people who raise their kids exactly the same and one kid turns out, you know, having really a lot of struggles and one does not. We want it. We want it to be true because we want to be in control and we want someone to hand us the recipe and say, do this and this will happen, you know? And I find that a lot of marriage education also falls into this trap, you know, um, I don't know what, I don't know where you stand on the whole Laura Doyle situation, but I feel like books like that really make it very recipe oriented. Do this and then you'll get that. And that just totally misses the boat on the complexity of human relations, right? But taking it from a Jewish perspective, and this is what I was saying about Musser being primarily about self-transformation, right? You should do those things because they're the right thing to do, not because results are guaranteed, Right. You know, Rav Shamsh Rafal Hirsch says in his commentary on Pergavos, he says a person should, you know, where it says that a person should always try to combine a profession with Torah study, and that will be the formula that will help him forget sin. You know, and he talks about in his commentary, um, which is my next book, God willing, working on that, um, why it's so important for a person to be um, financially independent so that other people don't call the shots for them. Mm. So, you know, however, It's an effort to become financially independent. A person can make all the efforts they want to become financially independent. They might succeed. They might fail, right? The point is, are you doing what you can, what is in your control? Again, you're defined by your choices. You're not defined by the starting point and you're not defined by the ending point. You're defined by the choices that you make. What that means is that if you are overall a good wife, a good parent, right? You're kind. You always try to improve your skill set. You try to forgive. You try to communicate. You try to see the other person for who they really are and accept them for who they really are. You try to make what's important to them important to you. You need to know that that relationship might still flounder. And that doesn't mean you're a failure. If you did what you could, you're not a failure results notwithstanding. That's the part that's in Hashem's hands. And I want to add to this, especially for the newlyweds, because we right now, unfortunately, have an entire generation of women who are completely freaked out about marriage. And I want to add to it that I think there is a complete dearth of relevant and helpful and tactical and practical information about marriage and having a healthy marriage. I was literally just telling this to my daughter. There so, is. I, so it's not, it's so, so, so yes, a hundred percent. I'm cheering you from the rooftops. Everything you just said, this is not in any way to contradict it, 
I want to add to people who who are hearing that without keeping that in mind that there is so much you can do. Yes. And it's not yes. just sweating and it's not just crying. It's also, there is so much information. This for me was the absolute turning point when I, you don't know my whole story, but when I was a newlywed, I really, really didn't think we would make it. I was completely, and this is why I work with newlyweds today. And the, the, the lifeline that I had was realizing that there is some skill to this. There is a skill that can uh-huh. be learned. And at the same time, a person can learn the skill and they can, they can devote themselves and they can take all the classes and they can do all the work that they need to do personally and exactly, they. So I, so I think some people are given harder spouses than other people. I think some people sure. are given harder situations. They're, they're, it's less of a match, or it's or it's more getting on the thing that really, really does trigger you or does bother you. And so we all have different things we have to dig into, and work on. And you know, somehow there's this idea that like I know I'm here to grow, but within my marriage, like it's supposed to just go otherwise. Right. Like right. something's wrong. No, if Hashem wants you to grow, of course, your primary relationship in life is going to be another opportunity for growth. Right. Um, so one of the things I, I, I appreciate you bringing out that point. One of the things I said in that parenting podcast, which is also tr- so true of marriage, you know, because people could just like throw in the towel and say, OK, fine. So to heck with all these parenting books, like what the results are not in my hands. What's the point? Right. No, 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 no. The learning and the growing and the trying, that all raises your odds, Mm -hmm. you know, of of having a successful relationship. It doesn't necessarily mean, from a parenting perspective, that your kid will turn out the way you or society calls a success, right? They're from, they're married, they have kids, they're making a living, however, you know, you define success. But the strength of your relationship will largely be dependent on what you do. You can raise those odds an enormous degree. Are there guarantees? There are no guarantees, right? And the same thing is true in marriage, right? It's almost like you have to hold these two opposing truths in your mind at the same time, right? On the one hand, my efforts are not always correlated with results. And also, you know, through my efforts, I am raising the odds of having a connective relationship. But I have to let go of what results look like. You know, if I think, well, I'll do this and then my husband will be really doting and he'll buy me the presents I want for Yentif and he'll clean up his hat and jacket off the table and he'll, you know, do his own laundry. I don't know, whatever, whatever you think is like, wow, when you see other people's husbands and you're like, wow, okay, if I do that, then my husband will do that. That's bartering. That's manipulative, right? Yeah. But can you raise the odds to have a connective relationship if you're truly willing to be accepting and generous and forgiving. Absolutely. Yeah. And really what it comes back to, I think, and, and you're, you're, you're getting to this, which is, am I looking at this person through the lens of what I want them to be, what I think right. they should be. And therefore I'm completely blocking my ability to appreciate and connect to that person. I cannot right. be in a relationship with a person if they're being evaluated according to some other standard that I've come up with yep. or have been fed. Right. And just sort of imbibed. But what I can do is I can compare the relationship to what it is when it comes to my work, right? This is the relationship with my child. This is what it probably will be five years from now. If I continue on this path, if I do this work, I can make that comparison. And I think that can be very motivating. I can take the relationship, the marriage that I have now and say, if I want to move this forward, it, but as soon as I get into the picture of this is what it needs to look like for me to check that box and say that it's right. It's what I need. That's when we get stuck. Yeah. And I think the problem is too, that a lot of like, when you're saying there's such a dearth of marriage education, and by the way, just to give you a job, you should totally write a book. Um, But everyone needs to join my membership when they get married. This is what we're doing. (laughs) We're educating, we're educating, but you're right. The book is coming. It's a show. Um, So I think that so much of, you know, even like Laura Doyle, I just, not to pick on her, but I just looked at her book and the the, the subtitle is a practical guide to finding intimacy, passion, and peace with a man. It's still transactional. Do this, Mm. you'll get that. Right. And a lot of a lot of secular or non-Jewish marriage books will, or even self-improvement books, will be like, do this to get that. You know, do this to find love. Do this to have resilient kids. Do this to have that. You know, that's not Jewish. It's not, it's not about getting a result. It's about you becoming an amazing human being. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the, the unpleasant truth 
is that you don't get to be an amazing human being without working your tail off. There's no shortcuts to that. None. And everyone exactly in the place where they would rather someone else's challenge, right? You will yes. be pushed in that one spot. You it's will so because that's where you need to be pushed. Yeah, it's so fascinating because like with your kids, you could say, okay, you know what, Hashem put this child in my life. And th- this is, okay, even then pe- parents need a lot of encouragement. This is the child I was meant to have. It's obvious. This was the child I was meant to come into my life, right? But with a spouse, you picked them, Okay. Mm-hmm. So in theory, this should be the person who poses the least amount of annoyances to you. You literally pick them by yourself. But of course we know that's not true. No. Why? Because Hashem put that person in our life to grow. The picking is almost, it's almost an illusion. Not that we shouldn't pick wisely and not that we shouldn't get to know ourselves and see, well, you know, which kinds of relationships with my friends make me feel safe and confident and comfortable? You know, those are the traits I should be looking for in a spouse. Of course, of course, of course, of course, be smart. But inevitably, and I don't care how long people know each other for, how long they live together, you know, in the secular world, people live together for years. And then they get married and they're like, what? Yeah. What? This is what you're like as a husband? This is what you're like as a father? Life threw us a curveball. I had no way of knowing how my spouse was going to react. I had no way of knowing how I was going to react to that. Why? Because life happens and life changes us and life challenges us. So even the spouse that we picked with supposedly our eyes wide open, it's still so clear that Hashem put that per- that person in your life for a reason. And it's usually all the stuff you didn't think about. And there's a mm-hmm. reason for that. You know, I remember when I was in Shaduchim and um, somebody said to me to say Parakuchav Aleph of Tehillim for a spouse. And our, our Rav actually just told my daughter to do the same thing. So that's right? I look to the mountains. Where will my help come from? One of the sukkim that we say in that chapter is by day, the sun shall not harm you, the arech balayla, nor the moon by night. And and this this teacher of mine who told me to say it said, what does that mean? It means that when you're dating, there are certain things that, that are going to be clear as day. Certain things that you see right away. Those things should not be bad for you, nor the moon by night, nor all the things you don't see. The things that are eclipsed. The things that you're not going to know about until after you're married or after life happens that you're davening, that those things also should not be harmful to you. Because as much as you know, you just don't know a person until you start living your life together. And I don't think you even know yourself. Right? That's for sure true. I remember when I was having my first kid and I was in Israel and I asked somebody, well, go to this doctor. And there's this like small birthing center in Telpio. I'm like, oh, cute, small birthing center. I get to the small birthing center and I'm like, whoa, stop. I'm a big hospital kind of girl. I want IVs. I want doctors. I want things. You know, I'm like, what was I thinking? I didn't know myself. Right. I didn't right. know what kind of birth I was going to want. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then you come up. I mean, you so much living happens for the first time when you're yeah. after the chuppah. You know, and this how is do you why, know how you're going to respond? And this is why couples who go through like, you know, serious changes in their lives, whether it's a financial change, the loss of a loved one, um, uh, you know, financial issues, the special, you know, special ed kids. These things can really throw marriage for a loop because nobody knows how their spouse is going to react to these totally unforeseen things. Yeah. And very often couples end up turning away from each other to find solace instead of to each other. Yeah. Right. These are things you can't know. We didn't start experiencing serious difficulties until we were married for 20 years. Mm-hmm. You know, and now that I'm married for almost 30 years and the past 10 years have been spent navigating parenting challenges, I think to myself, I thought I knew my husband after we were married for 20 years. There were parts of us that were just revealed in this challenge that neither of us really understood. And, you know, thank God we learned to turn towards each other and to put our marriage first and to make that the most pressing issue of the day. But that is a conscious decision that a couple has to make. Yeah. Yeah. You just have to keep pushing it onto the front burner. It's just so easy to take for granted. And I'm so grateful that you said that because 
I think that that's one of the things that we just have to keep in mind that the marriage relationship, it's an investment that pays off over so many years. Like we're in this for the long term. And sometimes there's, remember at one point when I was a newly, newlywed hearing a couple that had been married a very long time talking and they were like, oh yeah, that was like a rough couple of years for our marriage. And I was like, years, like <laughs> we got in a fight last night and I'm panicking, you know, like right. you get, we have to like stretch the timeline here for what we're looking at and how we sort of are operating. So absolutely. Absolutely. It's so true. Um, and I think, I mean, I know this is not so much your focus in this podcast, but I think it's so important to let young people know, like, you know, my teenagers that, you know, some people say, Oh, never fight in front of the kids. I don't agree with that. I think the kids, (laughs) I, (laughs) I think the kids have to see how their parents resolve conflict. Mm-hmm. There's a role modeling there. You think kids don't know that there's conflict? Kids are psychic. Yeah. You know, so at least a role model, here's how you disagree. Here's how you discuss, you know, you don't view politics the same. You don't view a family situation the same. You don't have the same opinions on how to raise the kids or whatever. Okay, whatever. If you're discussing that, kids don't do it. If you're discussing the kids, don't do it in front of the kids. But, you know, that they should see that there is a way to navigate conflict that is ultimately healthy and constructive in a relationship instead of just thinking, Oh, my parents never disagree. Right. hundred percent, hundred percent. And also to see the repairs. Yeah. For those relationship repairs, what do they look like? How does that work? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Because I think like you're saying, a lot of young people are afraid of conflict. They're terrified. What does that mean for my relationship? You know, conflict is just a starting, it's just another starting point for growth. You can become closer through your conflict. You talk to each other, you turn towards each other, you speak to each other respectfully, you uphold the relationship. You can come out way stronger after a conflict. You know, Mm -hmm. these past 10 years that we've been navigating so many parenting challenges, there is no question that we have become so much closer for having navigated these issues. You know, does that mean that there weren't rough moments? Of course course not you know there's so many things that that challenge a marriage but if you play your cards right if you really put in that effort you know and especially if, if both spouses are putting in that effort the relationship can be a thousand times stronger after yeah this was like so perfect thank you so much so i mean i didn't know that we would get to all of the things and i feel like we got to all the things and now i have a new book on my book list i'm really really looking forward to well, I have to decide if I'm going to read it or listen to it because now it's like an yes. audiobook version. This is very exciting. I'll make sure to be linking that in the show notes along with um, your Instagram account because I know you provide a lot of great content over there. Thank and you. the Spheros book that we mentioned, the DMC podcast. Yes, those are the other, I think the other two things that we yeah. mentioned here on yeah. this. And hopefully great. this will so, just like launch everyone into a really growth oriented Sphera season. That's awesome. Yes. So my book is called Soul Construction. And um, uh, and then I also teach two Zoom classes a week. So if anybody wants to contact me and join up with my classes, that's also an option. Amazing. How, and how could they get in touch with you? Um, if you Google me, my blog will come up and you can contact me through that. Perfect. Okay. Amazing. Thank you so much for taking the time to come on. Thank you. This was an amazing conversation. I feel like I just had coffee with a friend minus the coffee. I had the coffee. (laughs) (laughs) All right. It was a great opportunity to talk to you. This was really great. Hey friends. Okay. So I want to just put in a quick request. If you are listening to this episode and you know someone who's the person who would just have loved this episode, would you do me a huge favor and send it along to her? The easiest way to do it, and I'm going to include this link in the show notes is bit dot Lee, B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash glow podcast. That's going to send her a link where she can access it based on whatever podcast player she has. So that's the easiest way to share the podcast. I would love to just get it out to more people. If you don't have anyone in your mind or you want to do two nice things for me, <laughs> that's my happy coming present. I'd love to get a review from you if you haven't done it yet on the podcast. It again, is another way for people to discover this podcast. It's a huge, huge help. And of course, I love reading the reviews. So thank you so much and enjoy your Sphera and self-growth.